Who here would like to get whatever they want? <laughs> if you don't say yes, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> and by the way, first of all, be careful what you wish for. So to get whatever you want, I found that there are three things that you need to do. And this does have relevant for scaling and spread. The first thing is to work out what it is that you want. Very important. The second thing is to give yourself a time frame. Now don't get too stressed about it, it'll create cortisol in your brain and could make you quite upset. But giving yourself a time frame is not a bad way to start. The third thing though is the most important thing of all. And this is to tell as many people as possible what it is that you want. For it is in this world of abundance when you're trying to find a match that it dramatically increases the odds of getting whatever you want. Now the reason why I'm starting you with this is that I decided, and this is a conversation for wine afterwards, that I exist to change the entire world for better, all of it at the same time. Ideally, without anybody knowing that it's me. <laughs> I was one of three companies in the UK to get a Technology Pioneer Award from the World Economic Forum in 2008. I'm one of the pioneers of crowdsourcing and collective intelligence, so I've done a bit of stuff. But I realized I don't care about money, I don't care about stuff and awards. What I wanted to do is something really, 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 really hard. Now, I'm not a visionary person. I may, as we go through this now and then later, tell you stories that you think are fantastical, but I do not lie. I've got a whole bunch of very good sets of evidence around some of the stuff that I'll be sharing with you. But I decided, being entirely practical, that I would come up with a way of changing the entire world for better. So, I needed a pilot. So in 2008, uh, in Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe miraculously lost a stolen election. That was me and my buddy, Arthur. So behind the story, so 2008 at the World Economic Forum at Davos, I'd set myself six weeks to come up with a plan that involves collective intelligence, power of networks, and I'll share some of these bigger concepts with you so that you can do the same thing yourselves. But I met this guy on a shuttle bus ride, and of the 150 people that I spoke to to say, hi, my name is Mark, I'd like to change the world for better, he was the only person that listened to me. Everybody else thought it was bonkers. He may have been right. But he said, look, okay, I'm really, really desperate. Here's my problem in Zimbabwe. I'm an opposition party politician member. We will win the election, honestly, in Zimbabwe to try to get rid of Mugabe, but we know the election will be stolen. But here's the thing. I have no money. We've only got five weeks before the election takes place. And I cannot tell anybody what I am doing, including Morgan Sangarai, the leader of my own party. Can you come up with a plan to defeat a dictator in a corrupt election? Now, when I've been looking at this thing, and we'll get into this about sort of rules and behavior, I decided to give myself a few rules. I must like my own version of the Ten Commandments. My first rule is called, it's all easy. The second rule, very fortunately, and I thoroughly recommend you have this to yourself, is be lazy. So now, and that goes into the emulate and the copycat. So when I was listening to this guy, I had to work out, like, okay, there are 13 million people that live in Zimbabwe. It's good. How will Mugabe cheat? Very, very simply, he will basically cheat the results at the end, buy off the election officials. But what interestingly that meant was that people were actually voting honestly, and there was an honest count of the election. What also there was, was that meant that there was a count, and it either took place inside the polling stations, or in this particular case, a moment of transparency. Because what you're seeing here is the return shared in front of the polling station of the results. Who got which vote? So in this case, the answer was simple. Get a thousand people with camera phones standing outside the polling stations to take a picture of the final election results. Now here's a little bit of a problem. How the hell do you get a thousand people with camera phones standing outside the polls? Bearing in mind you have no money and you can't tell anybody what you do because you get killed for this. If you know what you're doing, you'll be nervous. You will probably be killed for this. So how the hell do you get a thousand people with camera phones? Anybody got any ideas? A famous person? But you want to get them killed? Actually, there's, there's many famous people. <laughs> but you've got to get a thousand. It's also Zimbabwe in 2008, so you might be thinking Twitter and everything else. Now, by the way, I'm going to jump to the thing. I gave you the second rule. What was the second rule? Be lazy. Be lazy. Okay, what's the laziest way of finding out the answer to this? 
you could Google it. You could just ask me as well as another way of doing it. <laughs> so how did you do it, Mark? I will tell you, that's the lazy, this is the, the, the key lazy way of thinking. So the idea is that pretty much be lazy, find people that already have camera phones. One of the questions that I asked is what percentage penetration rate of mobiles was? 65% fine, we got crap Nokia phones. Next thing, everybody exists in networks. Like this is a little network here. We have university networks, professional networks. So we need to find a network that is similar to what it is that we're trying to get to really scale and copy this at massive scale and basically infiltrate the network and activate it. Well, the MDC, the opposition party, had 15,000 supporters. So he sent out a single mail. Now he's the deputy leader of the party to say, I'm doing a project. I can't tell you what it is because you get killed for this stuff. But do you have a camera phone are you willing to help? Now, by the way, the spies did this as well. So the police informers, they also said yes. We built a system based on complete mistrust. So instead of ignoring this thing about trusted relationships, we built this assuming that everybody was a spy, but it didn't matter. A thousand people are told, take your camera phone, stand outside the polls, even if I reported it to the police. So what? I don't know why. Nobody knew what the plan was. Even I didn't know the plan was being executed because I did not need to know. A thousand people take pictures like this. This is taken from The Guardian, um, was then shared this after a couple of days. And we crowdsourced the election. A thousand pictures go to a website in South Africa, where 10 students turn the pictures into a big spreadsheet, without anybody being trained, without anybody knowing what they were supposed to do. And within just a few hours, we counted over a third of the vote and could prove to the world with physical photographic evidence that Robert Mugabe had lost the election. And that took 45 minutes of planning and 10 hours of execution. First time in the history of mankind. And that was the pilot. What I'm then doing, and this is the work that I've done on scaling, so I've also produced a book, a uh, paperback book, as my way of being lazy. Because to be honest, I, the only way that I can help change the world is by helping people like you that want to go out there to go do this. I've had the ability, um, and it's sort of personal desire, to really spend lots of time thinking and getting insight. I'll share some of that insight with you. Because I'm very interested in how do we scale the good stuff. It frustrates the hell out of me that people have really, really cool things. But let's say it's 30 places where you can do cage cricket and not 30,000. So how do we scale things? Well, for me then, also being lazy, is the goal is how do we get an incredibly outsized result? Now, this isn't just business, but this is also impact in society. How do we do this through small moves? Smartly made aided by good fortune. Now, I've got a few case studies. I just gave you one. I'm going to give you a, a sort of allude to the next one. What do you think the best-selling book is of all human history? Fastest selling. Bible? I'm sorry, and this is the fastest sale. Fastest to get 100 million copies. Bible? Gone with the wind. Harry <laughs> Potter? <laughs> 50 Shades of Grey, the epitome of humanity. <laughs> What was fascinating, so this has sold 100 million copies in two years. 50 shades of grain. And by the way, it has nothing to do with the content. The reason why we can say that is that the next best-selling pornographic book of all history sold less than a million copies. Now it's more, because the next person copied them. But what I found interesting when I looked at the story of the 50 shades of grain is there's a methodology behind this thing. There is a set of tactics and methods around scaling that allows you to do this. Now, I'm not going to go into the methods. I call these things scaling frames, methods of doing this. But I had a choice this evening about sharing with you, let's say, some practical tools or some big concepts. And speaking with Steve, you're like a conceptual guy. So we'll do some concepts. And like, who would like to go down the rabbit hole with me? Different way of the world. Now, by the way, just as a way of background, 350 years ago, there was a crazy Dutchman called Anton van Leeuwenhoek. And he was bonkers. He spent 10 years of his life writing scientific papers around seeing small things moving around in water. And if we looked at water right now, we couldn't see anything. So Isaac Newton was one of the founders of the Royal Society. And this group of eminent British scientists went over to visit this crazy man in his laboratory in Delft. And when they got there, they discovered that he had invented the microscope. The small things had always been there. But human beings did not have the eyes nor the lens to see them. I have had the ability to work on the human microscope, the human macroscope, how all these things work. I'm sharing with you the methods in this thing, and I tested it out on working to bring down dictatorships, because that's impossible. And yet it still worked. And now I'm in the next phase. So 
we're going to go down and I'm going to give you the tools for the human microscope. We good with that? So first thing, principle of emergence. Now I'm going to give you, um, how many of you know the term uh, complex systems? I'm going to give you the simple version of complex systems because I'm very lazy, I'm very simple. So complex systems. So let's say now we'll, we're a human system, we're two people. So what defines a complex system is that we're interacting, which means we're giving off signals and picking up signals. We have what's called a state memory, which means that we don't randomly bounce around, maybe later. <laughs> but there's a state memory, so it's not random. The third thing is that there's a progression over time. Now what's interesting, this will actually begin to start explaining why the copycat phenomenon is there and is very strong, is that what happens then is that, so we're complex, but now we're, oh, wow, crikey, there's a whole bunch of other people here. So we're now a complex system in a complex system. Our bodies are complex, our brain is complex, this room is complex. Now what's interesting, if you look at disruptions taking place, at any one second, in any one system, you can have something that happens, a cigarette gets dropped over, something gets set on fire, and that can change everything. But what's very interesting with this is that there's also an unbelievable amount of complexity. Now, before I come in, did anybody get given an instruction manual on how to use this room today? No? Oh, nobody? What the hell? But you're all doing the same thing. How the hell did that happen? What's interesting, and the reason why, and copycatting is a piece of this thing, is that in order to handle a complex system, we have rules. Now, these rules apply to us whether we're molecules floating around, stars, planets, or human beings. These rules allow us to basically conserve energy because it takes a lot of energy to change a state and it also takes more energy to, um, uh, to sort of continue your state. The rules tend to be, um, if in doubt, go for the one you know. Follow your peers. Copycatting is a strategy to conserve energy. Keep doing what you're doing until there is a compelling reason to change. I did a talk on Monday and I spoke for three and a half hours, so please at some point stop me. <laughs> Although I really enjoyed it, it was quite fun. Now these rules then pretty much mean that every single actor within the system, every element in the system can be totally independent and yet because they're constantly looking and constantly following, it now means that there's actually patterns of behavior emerge and they emerge extremely easily, ex just like this is a pattern of behavior. But there's a certain moment then that I got very, very disturbed by this because what it should mean in terms of innovation and the creation of new things is that we should have dynamically stable states with just random accidents pretty much propagating. And yet that's not what happens. The best way of actually thinking about how new things spread is a standing ovation. Now it's quite hard to get this thing engineered for here. But a standing ovation. So if we think of a standing ovation, we have a thousand people sitting in the theatre. Standing ovations are very, and it's the end of the performance, so there's pretty much, we have to leave and go to the toilet or whatever, so we have to leave. But at the moment we're clapping and we've got to work out, are we going to have a standing ovation? Standing ovations are very hard to have started from the back of the room, and there are three distinct reasons for that. What do you think? You can't see. But okay, but so you can't see the deviation. What can you see? Everybody is seated. And what about yourself? You're also seated. The reason why it's so hard to get a standing ovation start from the back of the room is that nobody can see, you see everybody else, and you're seated. What's interesting then is that to have the standing ovation take place, you need somebody to stand at the front. Now what's interesting in terms of energy is that from a systems perspective, from that, that group, it's extremely energy um, uh, sort of consuming to get 100% of people doing exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. So the system allows for deviation, people to do things differently. Individuals want to do things differently. For everybody with a nice new style, there's a stylist sitting in New York or not Los Angeles trying to invent a new style. They're trying to be at the leading edge. So now what it means is that one person stands up. That's the deviation. Now the next second or the next half a second is going to be interesting. What happens next? Now the majority of people, the vast majority of people will pretty much do what they're doing, seated and follow everybody else who are also seated. And yet there is a relative propensity to follow deviance. Which means then that maybe one person starts, now six people are standing. Six people and 20 people standing. And then all of a sudden, it's not 20 people standing, it's everybody. And there was one really obvious reason for that. I'm just going to borrow Steve for a second. Actually, no, Steve actually can... Uh, 
If Steve stands in front of me, I can't see anything. <laughs> the reason why the standing ovation starts and takes place and takes hold is that the basic rule of a complex system is you must give off signals and pick up signals. If somebody stands in front, you can't see. The reason why then the masses then stand up is not because that they're loyal or they're involved in the moment or social pressure. It's that, in that case, the very basics, they can't see what's going on. The reason why I describe this, and this is our emergence, is that they begin to give us structures to show how even though everything can sort of emerge and pop and bubble up, there are ways of finding individual things, new things, and spreading them at scale. Now I'm going to just give you, I know I've got about a minute and a half, I know I've actually already gone over, but just the, um, if I go back to the Zimbabwe thing, how did you get a thousand people with camera phones? Well that was easy if you understand how networks work. Since everybody exists inside of network, networks give you a trusted way of propagating a message. So this guy from Zimbabwe, Arthur, was able to share a single message to his network that got a thousand people to say yes. So since complex systems are all have network dynamics, it allows you to accelerate the spread of messages. And that last thing in, in terms of concepts is that what's interesting now, and actually now is going to be a good example for this and a good way to end, as soon as we have a stable state, we consume less energy. But this now means that from us as individuals and from the system perspective, we have a surplus of energy. So now the surplus of energy would like to be unleashed and carried off and do things. Now, 50 Shades of Grey, one of the things, the 16 things that she did is she caught the wave of e-books. I don't know how many of you will admit to reading 50 Shades of Grey, but half the sales in the United Kingdom were on Kindle, so that you could look at the BBC and then look at some hardcore pornography. Flip, flip. <laughs> But what this meant is that because this surplus of energy exists, you can tap into that energy as waves and you can propagate things at great, great scale. But now with that, we have a surplus of energy, which means it'll be time for the drinks. Yeah. And it's like to say thank you very much for listening. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. And thank you all. Thank you.